Joining us now is former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, who is now head of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, which was involved in two election-related cases before that court. Uh, good morning to you. Um, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of things to talk about in regard to what you don't agree with the court on, but you did have two victories here, sir. Uh, the state of Alabama will now have to redraw its congressional map to include a second majority black district as a result of this 5-4 ruling that the state discriminated against black voters. Uh, what's the political and legal impact of this ruling? Well, first of all, I think it's uh, an affirmation by the court that there's still a need for a vibrant Voting Rights Act, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, what the Republican legislature did in Alabama was clearly inconsistent with precedent, inconsistent with the way in which the uh, Voting Rights Act had been interpreted. Uh, Alabama has about 27 percent of its um, inhabitants who are uh, African-American. And yet, if you look at the math, they only got about 7 percent uh, or 14 percent of the uh, congressional seats. That decision will have an impact beyond the state of Alabama. If you look at Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, they also have um, instances where the lines have been drawn in such a way to dilute the voting power of African-Americans, and again, inconsistent with the Voting Rights Act. And so I think that you will also see courts rule, consistent with the Supreme Court's ruling, um, that uh, those lines will have to be redrawn in those states as well. In Moore versus Harper, the Supreme Court voted 6-3 to reject the theory that state legislatures can decide the rules for federal elections. I know Democrats had feared Republicans might use that to overturn results in 2024, like the former president attempted to in 2020. Does this ruling from the court, does the, the fact they took on the case at all, make you more confident about the integrity of the upcoming 2024 election? Yeah, it makes me a lot more confident that we're going to have a fair um, election come 2024 um, and that this ridiculous notion, this independent state legislature theory, uh, will hopefully just go away. Um, that was a, as fringe a theory as has ever been heard by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the only disappointment I have in that decision is that it was not a nine to zero um, decision. The notion of the independent state um, legislature theory was that uh, courts, uh, that, that the legislatures um, had the final say without any involvement of, of court review. Uh, and, and that's inconsistent with our notion of checks and balances. Uh, it will mean that we will have the ability to go before state courts to look at what legislatures and sometimes the gerrymandered legislatures are doing uh, with regard to redistricting. And just as in any other case, um, have courts have the, the final say. Um, that's the way our, our system is designed, and that is what the court affirmed uh, through that uh, through the North Carolina case. The Supreme Court did warn state courts, federal courts could still overrule on cases involving federal elections. Does that concern you? No, not at all. I okay. mean, uh, I think you want to have that backstop so that if a state court does something that is, you know, egregiously wrong, uh, you want to have the United States Supreme Court have the ability to come in and um, and correct that wrong. I want to ask you about affirmative action. Um, in this decision that race cannot be used in college admissions, there was also written by Chief Justice, uh, the Chief Justice's opinion, some detail here that seems a little confusing, frankly, because it says nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. In other words, the student must be treated on his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. So you can discuss race in a college application, but it can't be, how do you understand this? Uh, I don't really understand <laughs> it. It seems to me that that exception or that caveat a little inconsistent with the um, the rest of the opinion and the other footnote that says, well, this doesn't apply to the military academies, which are in essence nothing more than, than colleges. I mean, you know, colleges with a specialized mission. Uh, again, it seems to be inconsistent with the uh, the holding. You know, th the thing is that you know this nation continues to grapple with issues of race, um, and to say that race is not uh, a, a negative factor for too many people in this nation is inconsistent with just what the facts are. Um, the, the notion of affirmative action is to take into account just one of many things of 
when you look at qualified people, qualified students who are applying to colleges, look at that one one of many things and say, well, you know, for diverse for the sake of diversity, uh, we're going to take into consideration the fact that we want to have this black kid um, be a part of our university. But there's not a tension between the use of affirmative action and excellence. I think people need to understand that. You don't, affirmative action doesn't mean you get into a school simply because you're black. It means that you're qualified and that one of the factors that's taken into consideration of a qualified student uh, is that person's race. But one of the complications here in terms of the cases brought was the argument being made that affirmative action at Harvard an elite institution in particular, um, was hurting Asian Americans. Um, Jay Caspian King, a writer for The New Yorker, writes, affirmative action, it was righteous in concept, but hard to defend in practice. And I want to quote, if a society should make decisions with a clear eye towards history, a sentiment I agree with, shouldn't it also follow that a group who's expelled from the U.S. would at least have the right to not be lumped in with the people who kick them out. He's referring there to historic mistreatment by white people of Asian Americans, Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment. How do you respond to that argument? Well, you know, first off, you're looking at the um, Asian American community as a monolith, um, and there are a whole variety of uh, groups that make up the Asian American um, population in the nation. And you know what the proponents of this lawsuit did was to try to use uh, pit one minority group uh, against another so that they could ultimately reach their goal. They've been trying to attack affirmative action since the Baki decision back in um, in 1978. Um, you know this notion that somehow, some way, I guess if you think that everybody who has 1600 on their board scores, everybody who has a 4.0, ought to be admitted um, to a, a particular school. The reality is. If you just use that as a determinant, there are going to be way too many kids trying to get into these elite schools, and you're still going to have to make determinations based on other factors. And it seems to me that making race one of those factors, just one of those factors, again, with regard to qualified students, uh, is wholly consistent with our Constitution. I want, before I let you go, I want to ask you uh, to put on your attorney general hat again. Would you counsel President Biden or the next president, whoever that is, to consider a pardon of the 45th president of the United States, either before or after a theoretical conviction? I think I'd look, what, tell the president, the next attorney general, uh, you know, to let the let the system uh, do its work, uh, try the cases, see what the results are, um, and then treat that convicted president or any of anybody else who is convicted uh, as any other person um, would be treated. Pardons generally are, are for people who express remorse and then who have done things uh, that shows that they have turned their lives around. If those kinds of determinations can be made with regard to the former president or anybody else who was convicted, yeah, I would support that. In the absence of something like that, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that would be a wise thing to do. Uh, Mr. Eric Holder, former attorney general, thank you for your time.